Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO as we're playing in the Empire of Japan and I'm your host Mr. Mokolover of course. But we have a couple things we gotta go over. The moderate law. Reapproaching the die after the last session's incident, the Prime Minister carried with him a revised bill to present to the members of the House of Peers. He cleared his throat and peered across the chamber, brushing the room with his stern gaze, determined to pass this bill he had fought so intensely for. Takagi began to speak to the diet, reading from a prepared speech, and maintained a calm and controlled decorum to distinguish his own authority over the diverging interests tearing the Yos Taisei Yoko Sankai to pieces. Complete with all amendments, such as tight restrictions on the period of pregnancy termination and a government approved gynecological code of ethics, the bill had been taken apart and pieced back together many times over to find approval from conservatives in the House of Peers. Takagi waived the bill, priding it for his comprehensive covering of modern attitude towards women's health while acknowledging a respectful relationship it had with traditional morality seen as virtuous across the nation. Despite this, however, the amendments did not inoculate the Prime Minister from scrutiny, and scholars from conservative factions of the Taisei Yoku Sankai were frequent as he gazed into the crowds of men scoffing at his works. The Prime Minister finished his speech and sat down in the lukewarm tumble of applause that sounded from the dire floor. He rested his breath and checked his pulse, calming himself down to remain as still as the speaker began to just your vote. We will now be calling a vote upon this legislation, in which we get the death knell. However, if you see over here, we, we're, we're going to lose anyways, if we did that. And we, we did the death knell, and we lost support and stuff like that. But, as one of you guys said in the comments yesterday, at this point, if we have to even have to use console commands to get the, the better ending for us... I, that, I already went ahead and did auto, like, use console commands to get this finished and do secure the final votes for this part, so. If we didn't use console commands, we, we're, as you can see, we would have been given the death knell. Takagi's reputation would have had a great setback. Everything would have had a great setback, so. And in this case, uh, Kato resigns from her position, so. And his legitimacy are threatened, or a threat to the integrity of the government itself, and if anything is to approve, they must be treated as such, so. Negotiating with activists, which our support goes down. I mean, honestly, throughout this entire campaign, I'm not sure how to get any more support for the house. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, uh, launch a propaganda campaign. I mean, I guess you, I, we could have done that, but it doesn't tell you that, that you actually get that. Because sometimes, when I click on embellished accomplishments, we actually lost house support, so... I'm not really sure. I mean, we could launch propaganda campaigns, but that doesn't do much for us. Regardless, it is what it is. But, medals and wheels. Song Nam was just one of the countless miners that toiled in the mines for 12 hours a day, and with a few small breaks and barely any safety, he was paid enough to afford his food and bills, but not getting out scrape enough together for much else. It was a simple living, but he, like many other miners in the region, was always on the lookout for to make extra money for himself as he, if he could. On one of the night shifts, Song Nam and a few other miners were working in the deepest tunnels of the mine. They were tasked with the extraction of wolf from it, one of the rare and valuable ores that processed into tungsten, a vital component in the arms industry that ran the Imperial War Machine. They hammered and drilled chunks of the ore from the walls for, of the mine for hours at a time, but the twinkling glimpse of a shiny silver material had caught Sung Nam's eye. Acknowledging that supervisors were absent in the uh, early hours of the morning, the impoverished miners discussed and gathered around the vein. No one knew what this material was, but split equally between them, it was sure to sell for a high price. Sometime after his tiresome shift, Sung Nam went to the local market, filled to the brim with the chatter of the people in the little shops packed with trinkets and fragrances, fragrances bargaining, bargaining with a merchant. He sold the mineral off for a hefty sum, almost half his usual salary. The ore probably cost a lot more, but he was happy with the price he sold it for, as it was for the first seven months he could afford a fresh and juicy cut of meat for dinner. The tools of the crafty and cutting. So, coming back to this, we'll probably do this eventually, the great setback, but I do want to get through a groundwork for the future, just because we're so successful so far in this campaign, and to have it killed off and the you know, with a death, with a death knell, just, I don't know, I don't know, yeah, I don't know, it just, I don't want to finish this campaign being set back, I really don't want to, but we'll, I will still read it, but I want to get through at least this one first, the groundwork for the future, Tagagi's liberal political coalition with the Taisei Yoko Sankai and across the nation has gathered enough attention from like-minded reformists and political activists to build him a solid base of support throughout the empire, even with this, within circles of liberal students and feminists, Tagagi is hailed as the man responsible for bringing the social change desired in Japan for the modern era. While he's not immune for, to criticism from adversaries within the Diet, the Prime Minister finds his rule supported by a wider spread of the Japanese public. Notably, he commands the enthusiastic support of the young generation, carrying his praises into the new age. We'll see what happens. Our power increases significantly, and then we're going to have it decrease somewhat, so... Uh, yeah. Liberalization's defeat? Oh. Oh, we still get the effect? Anyways, okay. So, so, so basically, we're having both events happen right now. 
Takagi sat in the kitchen of the Kantai at his official residence to get a glass of water. He had woken up from a fever dream and climbed downstairs in his nightwear to clear his head. He had reached for a cup and filled it with tap water, taking a large gulp to hydrate his throat. He wiped his mouth of any spilled water droplets and leaned over the kitchen countertop for a moment to think. He could take his mind off of it. Following such resounding defeats and constant friction, Takagi was all of a sudden he had been dejected from the diet. He lived where the Prime Minister would live, and he sat where the Prime Minister would sit, but he could not command authority in the diet for much longer. Conservatives branded him a coward and a traitor. Liberals vilified him in accusations of despotism. He felt like there was no balance to be struck anymore. Takagi gazed out of the window and into the state's gardens and watched the moonlight or moonlit skies beam a silver lit or silver blue light on the short grass. He found a slither of peace watching nature so still in the deadest of the night. Another moment of silence and demoralizing ponder. Takagi made his way back to his bed and crawled underneath the sheets to find some respite. His eyes, he shut his eyes and tried to ease his stress-ridden body knowing that the next day would not spare him any rest from his now pointless administrative duties. There's always so much one can do. Which we're probably going to get, Takagi's going to get removed, which is something not good for us. Okay, sit back. Resignation, oh yeah. Uh, Takagi sat out of his, stared out of his office window just after sunset, observing the amber skyline of his great city for what he thought he may be the last time, listening to the distant honking of horns and chatting of protesters from his position. He held his hands behind his back and took a deep breath. He could not find peace in simply glancing at the monument of Japanese civilization anymore and brought him nothing but cynicism and fatigue. The newspapers this morning read that 30 more students had been reported dead following clashes with law enforcement in the rioting, and Takagi of all people felt pain by this most. He showed his eyes and reflected, questioning if he had done enough in his position of power across the empire. The dad could barely agree on anything in Japan's youth, a significant portion of the public, but forever remember him as a tyrant. Takagi was overcome with an immense dread, only noticeable in his deep, deeper breaths and glossy eyes. After a gulp, he harkened back towards the darkened sky uh, beyond the glass and turned his desk to find a pen. Nearly writing a few words, he glanced up and down and slowly guided his eyes across the office before returning his paper. Resignation, he thought. As he took a deep breath of this misty air, it's only way just too much. Man. Okay, how was he seen as a tyrant? He tried to try to do what he thought was best for everyone. And also, we are doing bargaining with rubber for Italy, so. As you can see, <clears throat> The end here of Japan, or even Japan overall, it, it's not perfect yet. It needs a definite polish, definite update, and, and it'll come in the future. So I do plan on playing as Japan again in the future, but this might have been rushed a little bit. So, okay, a brighter future for Japan. The Prime Minister stood by his office window alone, reflecting upon his time as, minister, as a premier. The sun sets golden rays dance between the jagged skyline of Tokyo skyscrapers, and as Takagi approached the end of his second term, he could not help but consider what he would have done differently given the chance too. Memories of endless compromise flickered throughout Takagi's mind. The uncomfortable dealings with Kishin Ikeda and the routine bargaining with independence haunting him. Compromising and throwing away potential for real economic restructuring to consume the Prime Minister, as he re regretted leaving much of it up to the whims of Nakasone out of frustration. Takagi looked down to what he considered tainted hands. Dirty with his involvement in the political corruption and coercion he rallied against in the beginning of his career, he wondered if it was a necessary evil or simply voluble if he just tried harder. Biting his lip, the Prime Minister retreated to his desk, falling into his leather chair and scratching his chin. He gulped and felt an overwhelming passion. All of the, after all the struggles uh, between these few triumphs, Japan had barely tasted reform. Uh, since his defeat fell over to Takagi, he realized the dexterity and determination that had initially surrounded his administration had fallen to waste, leaving him to wonder if he's fallen with it. There's always work to do, so we're not doing that one. Nope. Because we still got this. I mean, once we finish everything else, then maybe we can do the Great Setback, but... Oh. Middle East... What the... Okay, so, yeah... So, as I said before, uh, Japan's focus tree, little bugged. <laughs> now we can help out people? Okay. The sand settles. Well, okay. And I'll let you know I do have some cough here. There was another comment, though, too. <clears throat> that the oil crisis has already begun, but we have no focus tree about it, and we don't do anything to minimize it, so... As I said earlier, it kind of sucks that we are where we are, but let's go ahead and do railways to the north. In the north, infrastructure in Chozon has certainly improved since our annexation in Meiji 43. Railways cutting through the entire colony, but the system has since become over encumbered and overused. Greater shipments of resources traveling southwards have stressed the railways and often caused major disruptions in logistical organizations across the peninsula. Thus, we find it necessary to direct significant funds to upgrade and expand the railway lines in Chozon, with the aim of improving resource extraction and streamlining economic development. With the aid of Japanese engineers, the colony can benefit from a revision of the imperial administrative system cool we get more growth and obviously like the, at the throughout the last episode we're not looking too good right now in debt or deficit we have debt too that's not very good we're spending as much as we can so that we can build more factories up okay these aren't factories these are land forts can we build any more factories anywhere because if we can we are and then after that i'm probably gonna slash the living crud out of the budget all right let's go look i don't think we can build anything else anywhere else uh, one. How far do we extend? Do we extend down here? Oh, we, oh, there we go. Nice. A whole civilian factory. Coffee's pretty good, too. It's one out of one. Mukden, 20 years forward. Or onward. 
Nice. Six out of six. Yeah, I think we're pretty much out of space at this point. Zero out of zero, one out of one. Yeah, that's kind of disappointing. We're still building stuff up there, but we don't have that many more, that much more room for building civilian factories. So, we have plenty of lines. One, two. And the rest of these are just land ports. Okay, so, time to slash. That helps out, but let's see. Eh, we'll give slash at least once more. Minus 0.3, not bad, not bad. Oh, we can continue slashing, probably. Oh, well, let's not slash too much more now, because we did raise civilian spending. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Wow. Okay. I'm not going to help us that much more, but hey, every little bit counts. Okay, Mukden, 20 years onward. From a mining camp in the middle of nowhere to a local transport junction and onward to a huge regional hub, the train would finally arrive at Aishin. The day was hot and humid, and the scent of sweat and smoke filled... Smoked fish filled the air. Bai Yong Ho tried to get some sleep, but his efforts remained in vain by the general clattering and shuddering of the train carriage rushing down the railways. After some time, he decided to gaze out of the window. He saw a beautiful plain of fields with luscious bright green grass, and that instant his body shot forward and he heard a bellishing crash. Investigators arrived at the incident site only three days or three hours later. The train was in utter ruin. The carts had flown off the rails and were scattered across the field. Some of them were still burning. Most of the passengers managed to crawl out of the overturned carts and expose their seared flesh to the beaming sun. Many were not so lucky, and rows of lifeless bodies were left lying on the burned grass covered by dirty white sheets. Upon further examination, investigators noticed something wrong with the rails. The seals ripped and chewed apart like rotting wood. The track geometry report concluded that this section of railroad was no condition to sustain high-speed trains, and was in need of modernization. Trains swarmed the plains and hills of northern Chozon like blowflies, and investigators noted and this incident may be the first of many more potential disasters in the future. The report was shuffled by the various levels of administration in Chozon, until finally reaching Tokyo, where it finally held the attention of the Prime Minister, who had become concerned over the frequency of disasters. It's always too late. Suppress the subsurfaces. Ooh, growth. Taiwan is one of our oldest and most significant colonies, acquired in Maiji 28, and expected to become a model colony in the Empire of Japan since its annexation. We brought the island out of darkness, industrializing it and bringing cultural enlightenment to the natives. However, these modernizations have since been rendered outdated as a Showa era, and we should seek to amend this issue. We would direct funding and investment into reversing the backwardness of the remote parts of the island and bring light to those who are without it. Energy shall run throughout the colony to power homes, railways, and farms so that Taiwan may sustain its growth. Or it's growing local economy. That'd be good. It's going to hurt us in the budget for a little bit, but that's fine. It doesn't really matter too much. Cool. Let's attempt go on. And what else can we do here? Battle for Italy. Turn Italy against imperialism. Cool. Why not? We'll see what happens. And we can continue to increase deployment regulations. And actually, let's take a look at this. So can I actually do this? Like, So, I'm pretty sure I clicked on this before and actually lowered our house of peer support. That's why I don't touch this. And this does nothing. If I use the public, it does nothing. So, I guess in the future, whenever I play Japan again, or if you guys play Japan, if, to know that the top two, you want to use it for other people. When you launch a propaganda campaign, that's for yourself. Now, the mod doesn't explain it to you, and you think that it would, if it's green for you, it would be kind of good for you to use, especially if you want to support your own faction, but apparently not. Let's go and get the next focus first. For raising the highlands, the central mining range in Taiwan has limited our ability to move people and resources around the island. Often things are moving or moved by sea as, fa as a faster, more easier alternative to overland transport. As a result, many important locations on the isle remain disconnected with the roads falling into disrepair and railways simply unheard of. In an attempt to rectify this, we seek to allocate spending towards the development of appropriate infrastructure in Taiwan so that the economy of the island can be better managed. The use of our transport systems for movement of people and resources on the island can provide us with continuous returns and set a precedent for the future infrastructural progress across our projects across the empire. Orange and purple tones dominate the sky of the mountain slums as slowly the sun, the sun retreated from the mountains of Taiwan. Fen watched the sunset from the rickety balcony over so slightly creaking as she lit the lanterns. She rushed to the front of her house, turning on the porch lights to give everyone walking outside some light to find their way back home. Ever since the power had gone out and had never come back on for about five years, they all agreed to light up the streets whenever, by whatever means they could. For Fen, it was porch lights. For others, it was via lanterns and candles. As she fiddled with the batteries, the day finished its transition in, into dusk. One minute, the streets were dark. The next, all of the street and houses were soaked in golden light. Tens of people, from the elderly to the children who had barely learned to walk, rushing out of their homes, stunned by the sun of brightness. The tall white poles shone once more, as the metal roofs and rickety porch, wooden porches became bright as day. Perhaps it was useless to those outside the slums, but to the inhabitants here, the light was as beautiful as gold, to be struck by electric love. Love, 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 love. Minus point three. Hey, we're doing much better, though. Oh, and the air public has beaten up those guys. Oh. Um, well, we have a crisis here, but we're trying to expand and collapse it, but nothing's happening. Ooh, what's going to happen with Italy now? Are they going to join us, or are they going to say no? 
They are social democrats. They were libertarian socialists earlier, but now they're social democrats. Huh. Make up your mind, Italy. Make up your mind. And for raising the highlands. Yang Rogang was tired, tired from working 12 day hours just a day to make ends meet, tired from the endless arguments with his co-workers, tired from all this and more. Now, after his strenuous efforts, it was buried into the constant stream of cards that would bring him home. Today, like any Friday, the hordes of cards turned into a gas fuming swamp. If Ru Gang was lucky enough, he would be home by 10, but even the only thing he could do during a kept moment of solitude would be to prepare a simple dinner, set an alarm, hope that he wasn't tired enough to go oversleep. There must be another way, he thought. An old mountain road, Fang once told him that he, he takes... He sometimes just escaped traffic jams. It was quite an awkwardly disguised route, but if all urban roads were clogged, it should be a faster way to get home. Rugang smiled for perhaps the first time in a week and approached his own old Toyota. It was not as shiny as it was seven years ago, but it still did the job well enough just as he did. Rugang passed a dozen odd streets just to find one Fang mentioned, but in the end, he found an exit from the claustrophobic city and drove down an old mountain road. The path was bumpy, rattling his car constantly, considerably worse than what Fang told him. The cover, the road was covered in potholes, ruined by age and poorly lit with flickering bulbs every, only every few minutes. Even a neat, seemingly safe stretch of the patch could be dangerous. It was almost nine, his urge to speed up the journey babbled, bubbled in his chest. Rugang stepped on the gas pedal and clenched his hands on the wheel. His eyes were tired and drowsy, his head hit the ceiling of the car, his hands flew off the wheel. The vehicle tipped over and he gazed into the fast approaching forested earth below. The unknown will accept the exiled. Hmm. Anything for more? We get more debt with this one. Growth? Growth? Any more growth, please? The reports fail. Oh. Paving the way? Ooh, just with exp expertise. Ensure Taiwanese loyalty. To ensure Taiwanese loyalty, the previous administrations have attempted to divorce the Taiwanese identity from their Chinese cousins to the West. While the attempt to establish a distinction has been somewhat successful, the population has yet to adopt a truly Japanese identity. Thus, we've determined that we must intensify our efforts in Japanization and bring the native ta Taiwanese into the fold. With ample protections, work programs, and increasing increasing quality of life, our Taiwanese brothers will be far more likely to accept and assimilate into our customs and traditions so that they may too enjoy our cultural heritage and legacy. Heritage and legacy. Oh wow, we cut the cut military spending. That's not bad. Holy crud! If we get this, hey, we actually have a deficit again. Great. Now, how many factories are we not building? None. Oh, uh, I don't know about that. We can raise it up just a little bit more then. At least get one line going at all times. Uh, armor doesn't really matter at this point. Let's go grab this. Why not? So I was just looking minus two billion. Can we at least build something? We're at least building something. And even with the oil crisis, if we're smart enough, hey, minus point two, we can do okay. Hello to the little brothers. As Miss Shi welcomed her children back from school, she had prepared them Taiwanese fried chicken for the first time for the time to relax. She loved her boys and did everything to look after them as her husband was hard at work. She embraced them, hugging the boys tightly and kissing them on both the cheeks despite their juvenile squirmish and boyish chuckles. Uh, giggling and restless, the boys greeted their mother back. Konnichiwa Okasan. Her eyes widened and her jaw dropped as her children skipped away to play in the room. Confusion ran through her head and hammered at her skull. She wondered why her own sons did not greet her in their native Taiwanese Hokkien language. It must have been the school, she thought as she panicked, unsure of how to react. Her sons always praised the, very, the way things were in Japan. They watched Japanese TV and the Japanese stories, ate Japanese foods, much to her prickling resentment. They were losing their own Taiwanese identity, she had taught them. Our efforts bear the fruits of victory. And suppressive subversive disease. Our rule in Chozen has been at law over 50 years, but we have still been constantly beset by violent guerrillas and bloodthirsty partisans. Scattered and in small pockets, the few yet passionate guerrillas commit acts of terror and banditry in the countryside. We have effectively repressed any and all organized resistance in the colony, but sporadic harassment throughout the colony persists to this day. In order to stamp out the violence in the peninsula, Prime Minister Takagi has ordered for an increasing toko presence in the rural regions, up, upping surveillance and search privileges, and sanction lethal force if necessary. We do not need to worry about appearing as bullies. The Korean terrorists have de demonized themselves to the point of Chozen already. Oh boy. But at least the deficit isn't looking too bad right now. Wow. Yeah, the oil crisis really hurts you so much. Share the factories a little bit more. Go down to four. Go down to four as well. So we can at least get some jet cast as well. So, Jai T. G. Tai was scrubbing on the ground, his blood gushing onto the floor. He'd been shot at least twice, and the Song Chul had carried him throughout the shady back streets of Pyongyang. Even in his thoughts, Song Chul refused to call the city of birth by the name he was given to it by its occupiers. He was always, always a rebellious boy, fighting authority in ways that often caused him more harm than good. A sudden knock hammered from outside the barn they had seen found, or they had been found. Sung Chul, our death will not be in vain. He was at a loss for words, unable to react. Their lonely resistance cell was discovered before they could do anything worthwhile. The Toko's forces had stormed their improvised hideout and killed most of them in the raid. And only a lucky few found a way out to disperse throughout the next night for to safety. For Ji Tai and Sung Chul, their luck had just run out. <clears throat> no, it won't. No matter the time that we die for our motherland, we die. Our efforts will not go to waste. Jai Tai 
uh, left out a soft sigh of relief before coughing up blood. They smelled each other, thinking back to the times in their early youth. They had heard a loud thump, the door cracked open. The last thing the two ramshackle rebels heard was a sound of flash bang exploding and a rain of bullets. What awaits us ahead? Gotta love it. Too much at once. We have new expenses, costing 5% of our current GDP. Is this really good? Um, I don't know if I really want to do that one then. Untapped riches. The peripheries of our empire, although mighty and bold foothills across the Pacific, are relatively antiquated compared to the colonies of Chozon and Taiwan. In fact, they were inappropriately managed and mishandled by previous governments and remain so today. The North Borneo military administration runs up terrible deficits, costing us millions of yen, and the Melanesian islands to the south are underdeveloped and largely without Japanese civilization. We must investigate and report on the potential of the, these colonies acting swiftly in our interests of Japan so we may cement our extension over the Pacific. <coughs> Very good. <coughs> Cool, cool, cool. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice for some reason. Whenever I play TNO, my voice is like, nope, you're not going to work very well right now. No, nope, every other mod does okay. But TNO, it's just my voice that says no. I don't understand it. More oil, though? Don't mind if we do. We're thirsty for that sweet, sweet black gold. <clears throat> After that, we shall do prospecting in New Britain. New Britain? Ooh! The North Borneo Finance Report. The North Borneo Military Administration Headquarters is a Japanese Imperial Protectorate manned by the 37th Army Group and a key strategic position in our empire. However, the colony constantly dances on the brink of insolvency, often forcing the government to dig deep into our pockets to sustain it. In our mission to reform and strengthen the empire, we have no choice but to consider the future of the military administration. By drafting a fiscal report, we will better be able to analyze the state of North Borneo and its economic relationship with our government so that we can later release a more conclusive statement and create a plan for the fate of the Protectorate. We lose political power, but at this point, whatever. Political power is what it is. Very good. And let's grab some of this. <clears throat> All right. I love helicopters. Let's grab some of this, because we can. The Revolt of Earth. The mighty blast and rumble of an erupting volcano shook the waters around New Britain in a great burning wave of air rushed throughout the island. The roar of volcanic fury swept through the lands and seas as if the embers of hell had risen to Earth to scorch the untamed wild of the islands of the South Pacific. Running for cover. Locals dispersed into the woodlands in search of shelter, but mostly found themselves entrapped within, and now they're now dense and scalding air burning their skin. Immense clouds of ash towered over the surrounding villages and snarked or snaked into the air, dwarfing any vestige of human civilization that survived the darn beast or the blast. In the distance, an unusually large fleet of Japanese ships approached the islands, riding the crashways in armed droves. In the cooking hot sun, the metal ships sailed the seas and navigated the coast to observe the chaos. Sailors scattered in groups on the deck of the Titanic ships, gazing at the explosive marbles spewing great clouds of ash and rivers of steaming hot lava. They watched from afar, in absolute awe of the terrific sight of nature's cruel beauty, seemingly ignoring the wailing pleas of the natives for evacuation, continuing to witness the fearsome strength of the natural world as it ravaged the peace and fertility of the islands, the revolution of the sun slaves. Where's New Britain? There's Sion, Sionanto, <coughs> Puching, Insular British Columbia. Oh, well, I guess we don't have it. There's insular stuff over there. Alright, the last antipartisan operation. <clears throat> Our recent examination of the affairs of North Borneo cannot neglect an historically most violent and thuggish resistance to colonial rule in the area. The North Kalimantan National Army, despite facing heavy repression and constant attacks from our government, <clears throat> Their loosely organized partisan operations continue even after being forced again and again into the humid jungles of Sarawak. Thus, in accordance with their plans to reorganize the colony, we deem it necessary to trim the fat from the meat. Marine operations will be conducted throughout the isle to clear out and exterminate the last holdouts of the organization. In doing so, we aim to dismantle all substantial armed opposition from the native population so we may complete the task of colonial reform. A heart of steel and fire. Baba Mas Masao awoke to another humid morning in Kuchin and sat about going through his morning routine, shower, eat, exercise, as he has always done so since army cadet school, even if he wasn't as fast as he used to be. Like most 70-year-old men, he had grown weaker in his old age, less agile, slow of body, but not of mind. As much as he could, he liked to keep his body's de degradation or degeneration to a minimum by taking care of himself. Finally, when he finished his jumping jacks and push-ups, he headed out it onto his balcony where he would have his morning tea and read the latest news brought to him by his servants. The sun himself trying to see washed over him as he sipped his glass. Ah, uh, yes, stock prices seem to be rising again a sign of healthy economy, surely. That new American president seems to be having a tough goal of it with all that civil rights talk. Baba didn't understand why they did, didn't just use the military to silence all this dissent. As he flipped the page, he got another sip of his tea. His eyes bulged as he read the headline, trying not hard not to spit out the liquid in his mouth. North Borneo Economic Sinkhole. <clears throat> The article went on to elaborate how the region was a terrible spot for any entrepreneurial activity, as its corrupt administrative apparatus required constant bribery for continued operations in the area. Not only that, but its brutal treatment of its native population resulted in a less than ideal workforce. Bob couldn't believe that he was reading this about his own administration. How did this get out? Someone's going to pay. Filth cannot withstand the light. Hey, look, money. 
Yay! Minus point two. Man, can we at least get to to like an even zero? Hey, happy nineteen seventy one, everyone though. Let's go ahead and present to the diet. Having amassed enough information and evidence to drop a viable pro proactive plan for the future of North Borneo, the time has come to present our findings to the National Diet. We will insist on total dismantlement of the administration, a choice that many, may sound radical to many, but we assure them that this will save the Empire great amounts of money currently entangled in go-nowhere investments and a bloated bureaucracy. However, we also suggest that the administration is divided up into between our South East Asian allies, Sinoyan, Indonesia, and the Philippines. While we can list dozens of reasons why this is the best option for Japan, we expect that the House of Peers will maintain their distinctive skepticism towards any imperial reform we propose. And before we go too far, can I do this again? So, we'll do that. So, yeah. I mean, the game doesn't tell you that launch propaganda campaign. And we can do this. But if we do this, we actually lower our support. So, we don't do that anymore. And this does nothing. Go figure. To clear the jungle, the chief petty officer peeked into the boar site, al aligning the five-inch cannon. The rocking of the destroyer on the waves of the South China Sea would make aiming the weapon difficult for anyone unaccustomed to naval warfare. But the chief had, little, had a lifetime of practice. His loader remained silent next to him, and reading a magazine, the man was useless until the action started. The chief regarded him for a moment before glancing back into the boar site, moonlight shimmering over the peaceful waters, showing its beauty to him and only him. He'd fallen in love with the sea at a young age, and even now, years later, that love had not waned. He knew that he'd stay in the Navy until retirement, but out here within waves and goals, it was the only place that made him truly wholly happy. He'd never leave it of his own volition. Then he saw it. <clears throat> A light coming from the coast of the destroyer had been cruising along for the better part of an hour. Showtime. He whacked his loader on the shoulder without looking away from the sight, rotating the gun to face the light and zooming in with his sight. It was a small coastal village from the looks of it. <clears throat> a large fire burned in the center of it with the people dancing and enjoying the night. They saw the happy faces of celebration on each man, woman, and child's face. He began calculating the range in his head, adjusting the elevation, and with a terrible blast, he fired. My apologies, the white... <clears throat> The white phosphorus shelled sail or shell sailed flawlessly into the crowd of people, encompassing all around the fire in a burning white cloud. The closest buildings instantly ignited as the fire began to spread. People ran out of the white cloud, meshing flesh melting from bone, faces twisted in horror and pain. He fired again and again and again as fast as he, his loader could reach a shell. When it was over, nothing remained of the village but burned rubble. Any and all possible rubbles or partisans were dead. Another textbook run. <laughs> oh man. Oh man, oh man. And what, is there anything we can do about Italy? No? Okay. Next up, we shall grab some of this jet gas. And we'll grab stealth technology. Oh, no, that's way too ahead of time. Let's not do that one. Heavy aircraft? How about this one? No. How about this one? And proof spy plane that we're not even going to be using. Cool. All right. And then prospecting in New Britain. The Melanesian Islands in the South Pacific can be of great use to the Empire. Until recently, their potential was largely unexplored, but they are now known to be rich in natural resources and are themselves virgin islands. Uh, developing the islands and setting our countrymen in the region are, is a service to the nation like no other, and we can effectively govern the territories as if they were one of the five home islands of Japan. Given the right tools and planning, the isles can help us develop the reach we have over the Pacific while also cementing an immovable foothold in the region worthy of the empire. Speaking of the devil, the Prime Minister took his spot at the podium, reading over his notes for the final time. Soft chat echoed in the chamber from the members of the Diet as they waited for him to begin. He knew this had been a long time coming. Members of the Diet, I come before you today because I wish to start a dialogue about an important issue in administration. General Babo Masao, a veteran administrator and a commander operating in the North Borneo, has served his due time for our nation and the Emperor. I ask you of all, his, this hero deserves to return home in his old age. He paused for a moment and looked over the reaction of the diet. Most are silent, some nodding along, and a few vocal recognize what he's trying to do. I propose a solution to the vacancies left in the North Borneo administration for the Mr. Masao's departure, a partition of land between its Southeast Asian neighbors. <clears throat> I would wish this matter to be handled in a way that honors the Empire and allows the General to return home for as much unrest. I believe these actions would not honor Mr. Masao's uh, service, but also alleviate the situation on the ground. Thank you, members of the diet. He turned and sat back down as the argument started. The diet began beginning a heated discussion over everything he just said. Some decried this proposed plan to partition North Borneo, although most agreed that Masao had to be removed. Takagi side such as politics, bringing the devil to mind. Brings the devil to mind, yeah. <clears throat> Even less, so that's not good. But the GDP doesn't seem to be going down at all, which is nice. Not bad, anything here? No, 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 no. Expand. Daily crisis, well... Oh well. This China still has their focus tree, right? Yeah, they do. The Anami fields. And then, securing private contractors. With scientific and agricultural research pointing towards great resource yields in New Britain, we have been presented with a large or great opportunity to exploit the isles. Indeed, with the right partners and direction, our empire could see the great development of gold and zinc deposits as businesses flock to execute these riches and increase Japan's wealth. However, we are yet to choose what partners will aid us in this task. It is a task of the government to select private contractors to aid us in the development of New Britain, and the government notes whatever is chosen will have the unique access to the immense Mel Melanesian fortunes. This sun on the rocks. They came from M Miyazaki, 
from Fukuoka, from Kagoshima and Hiroshima and Osaka, and from the most neglected underbellies of the Tokyo sprawl. They were the ones without homes or prospects for the future, without money or food. They were the most desperate of the desperate, the festering dregs of Japan's forgotten poor. The crews often offered them a new chance of life beyond the isles, a fresh start and an opportunity to spread the rising sun's rays across, further across the world. Some distrusted their words, seeing them as too good to be true, but well, they wouldn't have been there if they refused. In the end, they also had no better option to escape the brick wall their lives were approaching. When they arrived on the isolated V2 Islands and the downtrodden were forced to were forced off the ship. Many suspicions among them were raised. The officers finally announced that the true intentions of this journey. They were there to establish an outpost to act as a foothold for the island of New Britain, south of there, for the glory of the Empire and the co prosperity sphere. They would be given adequate rations and starting supplies, but otherwise they would have to utilize the island's own resources. That was when the panic began. In truth, almost none of them knew how to even build a hut of straw much less how to fend for themselves on a group of Italian islands thousands of kilometers away from home. Some began by protesting, desperately trying to explain how it must have been some kind of mistake. They begged, pleaded, but the crew and the guards responded only by certain orders to get to work. The man tried to seize an officer's gun, a blow was struck, and suddenly the entire expedition tried to storm back on board. Chaos reigned for a full hour, and then when the dust settled, five of the volunteers lay dead, their blood spilled on the distant beach. Frustrated, the crew themselves threw the boxes of rations to the survivors and set sail for home, not even giving them, giving them the supplies. As the sun reaches noon, zenith. A lone volunteer cried out in frustration and fear. You call it colonialism, but we call it suicide. Fun times. Fun, fun times. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, budget. Better infantry weapons, the better we can colonize places with. Thank you very much. And then clearing the villages. The lands rich in natural resources have great potential for our empire, but many of the resource deposits are occupied by native villagers and or villages and settlements. An obvious problem indeed, but one easily solved. The Prime Minister will order for the eviction of these people from their lands and sanction the use of deadly force of resistance is encountered. We will begin the deployment of IJM Marines to New Britain so that they may accompany the geologists and businessmen already sur surveying the island. One way or another we expect the work to transform the island into a asset rich environment, which will begin soon, pocketing both Japanese businessmen and our government heaps of profit and revenue. Nice. And now I'm doing, I can't believe I'm doing this now. I discovered this like in episode like what, 11 or 12? Jeez. The offer, an, an all crushing sense of dread filled the Tetsu Ebihara. His business was running on his last legs, crippled by numerous debts, and now the government wanted to, its dirty finger in too. Almost and mysterious as ever, they sent a representative without warning to discuss an um, important topic. Mr. Ebihara, let's get straight to the point, the representative said, his words prickling Tetsu's skin. You probably already know about recent developments on New Britain's arch archipelago. We'll soon solve the problem with the natives, but the only thing we need from you is your cooperation. You're sp you specialize in logging, right? New Britain would be an ideal place to, for expansion. You wouldn't come here just to tell me that, Ebihara replied. Let me continue. If you sign this contract, we will grant your company 500 square kilometers of fine rainforest and land under it as you, to do as you wish with. However, we will require a promise that you will develop the land. Once it is in our interest, we, we will, of course, keep you from collapsing under the weight of your own debts. Ebihara looked up to the Mesopheles, sitting opposite of him, acknowledging that he had promised him the world and some more. There must be a catch, he thought, but the raw appeal of the deal distracted him from the potential to be caught up with mystery, mystery clauses and darning loopholes. What do I need? Where do I need to sign? Ebihara said, peering up at the representative's growing smile. This, right here. Also in the clause, it says you give your entire life for the Empire. But, you know, other than that, just go ahead. After we clear out a few pesky villages, we're going to paving the raid. The way. Our attempts to reform and strengthen the Empire have largely been a success. Our cabinet seems quite pleased with the results of their findings, and the Diet has approved of most of our moves in regards to our Asian holdings. However, our mission is not yet complete. We have achieved much in the name of the organization and planning, and now comes the time to execute what we have spent many tireless days and nights preparing for. We have coordinated with offices and administrations from across the Pacific, and at the behest of the Prime Minister. The next stage of our plans will be set in motion. The Empire shall stand stronger than ever. Well, let's hope so. Cool. And let's go and do this. Boom, boom. Budget slash. 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 And we're still making some of that. Not bad. Do not question greed. Accompanied by the Marines, the geological surveyors and businessmen examined and scaled the resource-rich areas of New Britain due for extraction. They were tasked with the eviction of natives from their villages on the land, and approached the local leaders with the aid of translators. Attempting to negotiate, the businessmen tried every trick they knew to convince the natives to lead to leave and alluded to financial compensation, but to no avail. With every word the businessmen uttered, a deeper red flush of anger swept over their faces as they too began to realize the ignorance and insanity of the proposal proposition. In their dealings, an altercation arose from the, the dispute. The natives were outraged at the ignorance and greed shown by the foreigners. The negotiators retreated back to their encampment, scampering to escape fr the from the increasingly rowdy crowds now gathered to heckle up the negotiators. With a failure to make a deal, it began noted by the field command that the marines were sanctioned to use deadly force in response to any resistance. They cocked their rifles and leapt from the back of military vehicles, marching to the settlements with cold, objectifying stares. Moving on into the small village, 
The Marines opened fire and mowed down the natives for having the Gauls resist the negotiations. The crack of gunshots and wails of natives could be heard from the distance as the surveyors awkwardly waited clearance from the IJM. Runways were shot, uh, homes were burned, and the survivors were beaten for their disobedience. As the businessmen and negotiators re-entered the village as they were met with scowls from the surviving and subdued locals. No stone left unturned. Ah, for the Empire. Uh, man, hopefully someday. I really want to play China. China seems very, very interesting. As they are, they are an extreme. At least in my opinion, they seem to be an extreme underdog because they are literally under the Japanese jackboot. So I really hope to play as China someday. After this, the colonial investments. Why not? The Empire of Japan, mightier and more powerful than ever, stands tall over colonial positions across the Pacific, from Tokyo, Osaka, and every other major city. Investments slow to develop our holdings, infrastructure, and economies. Today, bridges are built, tall buildings are erected, and the roads are paid in the name of our achievements in reforming the Empire. Jobs are abundant in the Melanesian regions, and the quality of life is rising. The Prime Minister has applauded for his outstanding successes in developing even the most uncultivated and barren corners of our Empire. We're almost there, I promise. Takagi-san, Nakasone said to him, it's time that I brought my concerns to you. It was a private meeting in Takagi's office, the blinds were closed, and Takagi found the sunlight disagreeable that day. The other cabinet member, members and ministers and I simply cannot condone what you're doing to the colonies. Much of it is simply wasteful. Japan does not stand to benefit from any measures you, that you propose. We implore you, Takaki-san, to take our advice to heart and pull back on these measures. The Prime Minister had been expecting such a response from both his cabinet and the liberals in general. He sighed. Still, it had come faster than he had expected Nakasone, the Prime Minister said. Trying to sound as sympathetic as possible. I know of your concerns. You have not approved my colonial policies ever since I entered the Diet. I am not a politician by trade, but Japan does, does stand to benefit if we administer our colonies properly. After all, Takaki smiled. Is not Japan the light of all Asia? <clears throat> Prime Minister, I found that description of the Kokutai as insulting. The Japanese people have also have their needs, and I cannot approve of measures that squander their hard-earned victories of the Japanese people. Of course, of course, Takagi replied, trying to calm down Nakasone. The Japanese people have their concerns. However, think of this as a way of this, the way, Nakasone. Well-administered colonies would mean a lot less strain on the home isles. I trust you understand, for if these ideas form a core part of your economic ideas. Prime Minister, I, I think we are in agreement. I guess we shall see. Hmm. Well, at least I know how to play Japan now. It only took me until 1971. Uh-oh, the Shah of Iran has been assassinated. Suppress the environmental movement, huh? <clears throat> Does that give us more money? Begin the dismantlement? Ooh, growth. The time has come to withdraw from North Borneo and do away with millions of yen wasted each year spent supporting a costly military administration over Sarawak. Our ships will arrive soon to release General Baba and his men from their posts and return them home, where they'll be welcomed as war heroes and patriots. Upon their arrival, medals will be awarded, military songs chanted, beautiful girls kissed, and the administration will be dismantled entirely. With the money now safely conserved in our coffers, our government can now direct more funding, investment, and energy and attention towards properly developing our mighty empire. But we shall cut the red tape. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Tanaka said, pointing out to the country bridges he was to christen, Welcome, I'm here in, not the Iranian civil war, but in my official capacity to christen this bridge and approve its usage as a method of public transport. He smiled to the crowd who looked on with bored faces. Some even yawned as cameras snapped at a, at a particularly grisly image of Tanaka's bare, gaping tooth mouth. G gape tooth mouth. That'll be the opening of the next month, Taiwan's tabloid issue, but he bet. Tanaka hated his job, everyone hated him, yet no, ma no one wanted to vote for anyone else. Mr. or Mayor Tanaka, <clears throat> a, a reporter raised his hand, a, a question? Well, might as well. They at least this guy is showing curiosity, perhaps indulging him with, with a limited crowd. Maybe not. It's best to try anyway. Ah, oh, yes, young man, what is it? A little taken back by the mayor's manners, the reporter paused for several moments before he continued. Awkwardness filled the space of sounds. Well, he began, did you outsource the concrete and cement used in the construction of this bridge to a cheaper, non-government sanctioned corporation? Now, everyone was interested. Board stairs turned into nervous glances, and the crowd was stunned. I, well, mmm... Tanaka began. I think that's enough for today. With a snip of his scissors, he christened the bridge, and no one, but no one clapped. The next morning's newspaper featured Tanaka's embarrassing gap, gap tooth, and was headlined: "Boring Mayor Caught Red-Handed and Corruption Scheme." What a god dang mess! God dang it! Should have fixed my tooth. <laughs> All right, and then to the victor, of the spoils. New Britain's dig. Ooh, growth. Suppress environmentalist movement. A movement across Japan has recently surfaced critical of the increasing industrialization, carbon emissions, and resource extraction across the sphere. Concerned with the preservation of the natural environment, now threatened by rising pollution levels, young people fill the streets and universities to spread these lies, poisoning the growing strength of our empire. And understand this vocal opposition is key to defeating it. We will begin using interrogation and infiltration as our key tools in stopping out the environmental movement before it can truly undermine our administration's efforts to strengthen the development of Japan. A plea of fiery eyes. Baba Masao looked at him in, uh, himself in the mirror and found an old, wrinkled man staring back. His belly was inflated, his arms were pudgy. He chuckled. Time had left behind that dashing general, the guerrilla hero who fought against imperialist forces in Sionan. Was it really 20 years ago? Masao 
found it hard to believe that those years could pass by at him as easily as pick the leaves picked off by the wind. At least his uniform was still in an acceptable condition. Metals gleamed on his chest that he heard a knock on the door this time to go. Outside, crowds of the natives greeted Masao. He got into the car and the parade began. To his left and right, the copper-skinned and sunburnt inhabitants of this place threw out cheers to him, hailing him as a hero, or so he thought. He could, they could have been as easily throwing insults and jeers, happily that the Japanese military governor would be gone perhaps forever. Masao preferred to look for the silver lining. He would see Japan again and return to Kuko Kumamoto was no longer a dream. Once they were out of sight of the crowds, Masao sat in his car, exhausted for some reason. His tears welled up. The chauffeur concerned and leaned back. Baba-sama, he said, are you all right? The words that came out of sounded broken in the voice of no hero. Please, they cannot do this to me. They, they, they cannot. Well, we'll see what happens. But hey, GDP growth. Britain's new digs? Why not? With our economic interests finally anchored in the Melanesian Islands, our great research projects are due to be finalized and open to private industries. We expect to rake in enormous streams of revenue and develop the region beyond our original ambitions for the Isles. Despite the heaps of cash already flowing into the tropical island, we have yet to denounce the opening of an offshore oil field to drilling contractors eager to make billions from crude oil. Excuse me. The immense wealth creation in the business is due to bring great riches to the empire and circulate throughout the sphere, clearly proof of Japan's economic might over the Pacific and East Asia. <sighs> GDP growth. I love it. The Wild, but we'll read that very soon. Let's go and go with this one. Better APCs. Don't mind if we do. And let's grab some of this. No, it's a little bit ahead of time. Let's not grab that yet, then. Artillery? No, nah, it's, it's a little bit ahead of time. Support equipment? Yes, please. Engineers? Not bad. Improve main battle tanks? Thank you very much. Anything else? No, no, no. Good, good, good. Very nice of the wild. I am not a Kempaite agent, Kenshin thought to himself. I am a professional stalker, sitting in a cafe in Kyoto. As I instruct a woman, Kohaku. HQ did not give him ample explanation as to why he'd attract this woman. Still, work was work, and Kenshin had to provide for himself. If being a creep was part of the job, he would do it darn well ex excel at it. It'd still be nice if the agency would actually tell him why. He he'd like more than she's an activist, go see what she's doing. Kenshin's tea cooled as he watched a woman enter the cafe. He averted his eyes almost immediately. No offense to the young lady, but Kenshin was a married man. He saw the lady sat down and ordered a coffee. After that, she did nothing. Nothing at all except read a novel that she brought with her. It was the kind of cheap trash that young men and women read in the stacks these days, but whatever. He noted the title. Maybe HQ was looking for the survey on the youth's interest in literature. Then an acquaintance. He set himself down in a chair opposite to her and spoke. Of what? Is this an extramarital affair, the dramatic meeting of two lovers estranged by society? No. No, it couldn't be. They talked about the arrangements of flowers. I am serious, Kenshin wrote in his small notepad. They talked about flower arrangements for nearly two hours, and then they left. Kenshin had some choice words for his assignment. What a waste of time. What a complete waste of time, Marino. Britain's new digs, though. And when's the next research done? In about 20 days? Oh, we got time for the next one, then. To the victor go the spoils. With a military administration in North Borneo lifted, Mal Malayan, Indonesian, and Filipino emissaries have been invited to discuss the finalization of our plans to divide the land amongst our allies. Accompanied by the anthropologists and geological professionals, we welcome the emissaries and settle them into the talks over the future of Southeast Asia, in particular, who will get what in the division of the dissolved colony. While those agreement and squabbles might arise over the minuscule land disputes between our representatives, the Prime Minister remains charismatic enough to bargain with all three parties and intimidating enough to force them into an agreement. Oh, the Free Church would declare the Siberian Black League, or Omsk, a meeting in Kaso Kawasaki. Cool. Anything else here? Ah, oh, we did it. We have 0% GDP growth, <laughs> which doesn't sound very good by itself, but hey, nice. A sinkhole. Takagi met with his cabinet in the early morning. Almost all of his men were tired, some still yawning from barely putting themselves together when crawling out of bed. But Takagi was wide awake and freshly prepared for action. Capitalizing on early fatigue, he came at them with a swift proposal. In order for the settlements in New Britain to be profitable, the government had to subsidize the development of the region promptly by pumping millions of yen into the local economy. The sheer cost of the proposal shook his entire cabinet awake as they were taken aback by the magnitude of the proposed investment. Nakasone let out a deep breath of air and cackled, unable to contain his laughter at the proposal. The Prime Minister wasn't so humored and scouted the minister for his inappropriate half awake reaction after spending a while explaining to his men the necessity of the investment and the stakes if they were to retract their administration's subsidizing oversight. The cabinet approved of the proposal much to Takagi's relief. The first win of the day. Look at that. That's just so good. After having uh, at, at most minus 4.4 but percent, but here we go. The black hole. Meaning that this cabinet again over the issue of New Britain. Takagi gathered his men in the office and treated them to refreshments. Unfortunately, however, they were already sobered up by midday and were wide awake to fully comprehend the ridiculous scale of Takagi's proposals. As he insisted that New Britain needed even more investments, doubling the initial investment or amount to be put in the colony, his cabinet let out a collective embarrassed sigh. The Prime Minister, picking up the disdain and rolling his eyes, urged his cabinet to look past the numbers into the long term. A permanent foothold in Melanesia would be a major victory for Japan. Nakasone pinched the bridge of his nose. Kido became the first to reluctantly agree to the plan and slowly others followed. The Prime Minister thanked his men and offered more to drink, which, to which they murmured polite refusal. A victory nonetheless. Just get really, really intoxicated and everything will be okay. At least for the current day. Let's grab some of this. A drop in the sea. Ooh, yeah, we can do that anyway. 
The report had finally come in detail in the development of New Britain. While settlements have been founded across the island and refineries have been pumping oil at extraordinary rates, it is not enough to make the money back invested into the project. Nagaki scoured the report for any redeeming qualities he could pre pretty his presentations with, but no to no avail. He scrunched up the papers in his fist, dashed them across the room in a fit of rage. The time came to present his cabinet to his cabinet in the late evening. The environment shared between his men was calm and relaxed as they unwound for the day. They clinked the glasses and applauded the Prime Minister as he stepped up to present them in the boardroom. He gave them colorful ex explanations of the levels of employment on the island, as well as the soaring levels of production and output from the island's offshore were drilling, his cabinet applauded and thoroughly impressed until Takagi confessed to them the profits made from their investments. The negative numbers shook the ministers. The prime minister pursed his lips in embarrassment and could offer nothing but banal platitudes to soften the blow. Economics is a game of luck. Well, it's a game of some luck, I guess. At least the public liked us, so why would we want to resign? Cool, let's grab that, and then we'll grab some heavy aircraft. Oh, we're doing that one already. Land auction. I'm avoiding the ships for now. Armor, artillery. Artillery we already looked at. Support equipment. Military police. Nothing can go wrong with the military police. Thank you. More jet cast. Thank you very much. Improved spy plane. And let's come back over here to infantry. And do this. Better marines. And we shall do Japanization continues. Ooh, look at that. Not bad. Our presence of assimilation and civilization in our colonies has proven extremely successful in Chozon and Taiwan, and our government is determined to continue the initiative in our Pacific territories, just as we have industrialized and urbanized Chozon and abolished backwards traditions in Taiwan. We will seek to enlighten the peoples of Melanesia by assimilating them into the Japanese way of life. More and more Japanese migrate, migrate to these colonies, bringing them with them our traditions and values. We aim to successfully integrate these native peoples into our customs and raise them from our own indecencies. From their own indecencies. Indeed, the Empire of Japan leads with an altruistic guidance, determined to lift our subjects from darkness. I'm meeting in Kawasaki. Emissaries from Seonan, Indonesia, and Philippines have convened in Kawasaki to discuss the fate of northern Borneo, slipping from airplanes and a flamboyant show of international cooperation. The Prime Minister, however, has no tolerance for the flashing cameras, hurrying the diplomats into a great hall to begin the talks, and finalize agreements for the end of the North Borneo Military Administration, debating and discussing around a round table. The Prime Minister guided talks between the three nations about the territorial future of the region. Proposing many plans to the diplomats, Takaki attempted to juggle the specific and sometimes unreasonable demands of each emissary, exhausting him and his patience, and a particularly heated argument between the three. Takagi stepped away from the bickering and diplomats for a moment and thought to himself, who was the prime minister in the room if he served these powers hungry, these power hungry representatives like a slave? They apparently did not notice his momentary disappearance, and he scoffed and braced for hours of squabbling, returning to his duty with tired eyes and a forced smile. Japan gets tired of leadership sometimes. Oh yeah, pretty much like any nation probably. Minus 3.5 billion, not bad. When the debt is still only 2%, which is not bad either. And actually, what's the next research going to be done? Not soon enough. So, after that, too much at once. Well, let's go. We're gonna go through the rest of these, and then I'll probably use comms commands for this, just because to get through this. Because at this point, this stuff doesn't even matter. The Middle East is pretty much decided, so the reports fail. I guess with well, the rep rep presentation convinced many to die. It did not convince enough. As expected, the House of the Peers rejected our plans for North Borneo, snickering at the mere notion of withdrawal. We must return to our other plans for the Empire and learn of this encounter. Our cabinet is not surprised with our failure, but any apathy must be nipped in the bud. If we want to succeed, we must not give up now. We're committed to strengthening the Empire of Japan, even if our smirking opponents do not think think not. I don't know. I mean, it's there. I want to do it anyway, so. It's not good for us, obviously, but. <clears throat> still. Very still. 40%. 42%. Not bad. And they still exist. All right, cool. Too much at once. Our police were chosen on in Taiwan as logical and righteous as they may have seemed. A buckled under the incredible weight of our imperial bureaucracy, allocated funds have disappeared, and local administrators seem to have pork barreled in their own projects in both of our neighboring colonies. We've seen very limited successes in the suddenly medicine situation, and those success few successes have installed us with the negative externalities of employment and unemployment and local price inflation we must now turn through. Needless to say, the Prime Minister is very displeased, and our cabinet is at a loss as they attempt to mop up the clutter of our recent failures. Whatever. Bornean Twilight. Sakai stroll through the jungles of North Borneo to reach out to Baba Masao, the commander of the Japanese military garrison in Sionan. The offices of the administration lay in the north, and the mountainous and craggy terrain of Sarawak spread out behind him, hiding the jungles, the high jungles with a veil of grey mist. The warm winds blew seawards, venting the oppressive heat from Sakai's body. His destination was a shrine or shrine in one of those hilltops near the administrative complexes. Masao often mediated when the there when he was not whipping the locals to submission or bullying his subordinates. Needless to say, Sakai hated his role as a courier. At least the news was good for Masao. The feeling of discon discomfort grew, blossomed, and flared within his chest as his feet grew, drew closer to the shrine. Every instinct in his body told him to bolt into the nearest jungle to escape Masao's clutches forever. However, the hide-veiled forest coldly looked on. They did not help a man escape civilization. 
When Sakai reached himself, he found the old commander med meditating his position or posture cross-legged. Sakai was a courier, a soldier. He had no business of kicking a hornet's nest, and so he decided to wait. Sitting on the entrance of the shrine awkwardly, he waited until Masao opened his eyes and stood. Sakai Sakai uh, called out to him, Ma Masao-sama. He said, a message from the HQ. A most auspicious piece of news, Masao-sama. They let you stay here for another year. Masao smiled and dismissed. Thank you, better a quick dismissal than bullying. Sakai supposed. He broke into a run when he saw that Masao had returned to his meditation. No, is this justice no more? Well, obviously, this doesn't seem like a focus that we should really take. It seems like there's supposed to be like a decision we can take in which this is a potential possibility that we get, and that's not good. Because we already sent Masao back to Japan, but whatever. The great setback, most of the Prime Minister's fury, the student and youth organizations driving the protests. Oh, come on, stop, 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 stop. Uh, driving the student protests have lost interest to Kaki's political agendas and have withdrawn their support from his government. Moreover, the resignation of Shizue Kato has weakened the position of the liberal faction in the Diet as she rails against the Prime Minister and newly published articles. The, these explicit attacks on Takagi's legitimacy are a threat to the integrity of the government itself, and is anything to prove they must be treated as such. Buckling are under our own weight. How much debt do we have now? Not that much. Slash. Slash. Wait, what happened here? Why do we have so much more debt? Uh, civilian spending? No. Huh. We have more, way more debt now. How the heck? Other expenditures. That's what's up. Buckling are underway. Uh, it's because of the colonies. When Hisaguchi first left Hiroshima on a ship bound for Taiwan, his heart ached. He missed his home and sweetheart. The faces of everyone he knew slipped away, all leaving only hints of sickness. He was sure that at the moment, his face must have been as green as an algae that constantly drifted besides the ship's hull. Where he would go now, he thought, his thoughts turning tris Tossing, turning, listening from port to starboard to every few minutes. Looking back on his days on the ship, Hisaguchi, who never thought that he would become the administrator of a portion of Karenko. At first, he hoped that he would be placed in Tainan, where it was, where it was most Japan-like. Instead, they stuck him in a rural area where friction between local and Japanese customs tempered the dull days baking under the sun he missed winter. However, Hisaguchi struck gold. Took was particularly generous with the distribution of funds for the purposes of aiding the local populace at first. Hisaguchi tried to use the money in good faith. He contributed to the electrification of the district in which he resided. However, debt collectors came for him. On a straight for his gambling debts. In desperation, Hisaguchi took the money out of a safety box and waited for retribution. Nothing came. Hisaguchi was happy. From then on, he took the money at first. It seemed like bit by bit, piece by piece. Nowadays, Hisaguchi thought of the funds as extra wages for the month. He did not care anymore. This place was a crap hole and he would do anything to forget about it. Sympathy for the devil? So, basically, yeah. Now we got only more cuts. If we do that, we still have an annual deficit and we're not making anything. Which is kind of fine. And uh, it seems like this is probably going to be the last episode in this campaign. Obviously, you guys can tell I can't because I don't it's in the title but with that done with that last focus and we'll read about this i'm just gonna use consequence for this just because it depends on who we want to support it's not in the faction hmm take stuff saudis and sphere send arms to these guys do we have uh, descriptions saudi ravers are best potential out of the middle east okay uh we get set back and we get an event no okay okami sasusen it, the safest bed in the middle east is the italian empire Prevail against the Arabs, our natural ally, a providable geopolitical chip, reserve our support, or this one, the UAR. I actually, I want to support the Italians then. The safest bet in the Middle East is in the Italian sphere. It's more likely than they will be able to prevail against the Arabs. They're our natural ally, a valuable geopolitical chip, and deserve our support. Maybe this will help us with our uh, increasing relations with them. Maybe. We'll see what happens. You know, you never know. But yeah, like I said, this is probably the final episode. Unless there's more content after this, which I don't think there is. I think... Pretty most countries have up until like 1971. Even America starts breaking near the end. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But man, this debt. We were doing so well. We were doing so well. And then we have other expenditures. Uh engineers. Why not? Recon? Sure. We're still training our guys though. Well. Wow. Oh, um, maybe you should stop training because it looks like you're really injuring yourself. And we don't have enough equipment anyway, so. And also, Goring did not finish because it's led by Shorner. And if they're not fast enough, Shorner accused the government and, well, they can't get any more stuff there. And they didn't. No, well, they didn't even take out Switzerland. The king. Is Switzerland the kingdom? Ephraim Catalan, huh? Cool. And then we'll go with the from the old alliance. It's a reform our alliance with Italy. Not only are they a valuable prize in the Cold War, but they're our best chance to secure interest or limited support. Offer limited support, although the Middle East is a significant part of our foreign policy, it's critical we not extend the IJN and AJA by overbearing themselves? No, the best option for political and economic interests is to reaffirm alliance with Italy. They are a valuable prize in Cold War and also a great best chance to secure our interests. Can we do anything in Italy? Please, let me do something in Italy. Well, whatever. 
At least this way, we're not training our guys until they all die. Let's see. Still need more tanks, of course. Still need more... We just need a lot more stuff, in, period. That's just all we need. Just more stuff. More anti-tank. Wait, do we not have anti-tank? I was pretty sure I put on anti-air. Huh. Then again, I, I, I replayed this like, like two or three times just to get like good settings for us, so... There you go. I should do it like that, probably. Go down to military police. Cool. No, we're good for that. Get some maintenance companies, not engineers. And some field hospitals, because we can. Oh, look at that, Dad. It's already 6.30. Oh, why? Why do you pain me so? Well, this is not going down anymore, but... Oh. You're from the old alliance. Rome took your alliance. Desperate times. We were reading about this. Hours late in the Middle East. We must provide rapid emergency aid to the Italians to prevent their collapse. Or, to form a secure alliance with the Italians, we must establish a new diplomatic channel. An access between Rome and Tokyo. This uh, di domestic or diplomatic partnership will be a valuable partnership for both states. I do apologize for my voice. Because my pronunciation skills really just fail when I'm reading so much. Oh, wait, we can't do this one? Why not? Wait, what? Is it because we're not in an alliance? Oh, liaisons? There, Japan. We'll help you. Or, you guys. Uh, it's apparently offensive. Oh, crap. Are you kidding me? You know what? At this point, the campaign's already kind of screwed up anyways. I'm going to show you what I've used in console commands. I've used focus autocomplete no checks for earlier for the other thing. So, decision dot no checks. Because at this point, I mean, give them the order of the rising set. We'll do that one anyways. Just give them that too. Like, I apologize for doing this, but it's just kind of what we have to do. I want to get a good ending for this. And if we can get Japan or Italy, the Japanese sphere, that'd be great. Or together, allied, or whatever, the faction. And obviously, Iran is falling apart, so. Suck to focus. The sand settles, huh? I'm just, I'm, I want to wait first to see if we can get them with us. I want to get these days done. It's only three weeks. So, I'm, obviously, we're going to get more political power if I'm doing this without doing a focus, whatever, but. Actually, did you guys change government yet? No. They still have content. Economic justice. The militarized economy, huh? Marines 4, huh? Because if we get those decisions done, then maybe, 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 maybe things can get accomplished. I don't know. Maybe we can get them in alliance. Because as, we, as we've seen in the past few episodes, this is definitely bugged, so. That's not very bueno. Why do you pain me so much? Actually, and our military, army professionals are still going down. But our expertise is going up, which is good. As well as our poverty is doing better, too, so. Another division. I screw, you know, at this point, screw the infantry. Thank you for buying. How much does that help our budget? We got a lot more manpower back, too. That does help a little bit. What about these guys? Goodbye, guys. Let's grab some better air assault. Italy aligns with America. Tokyo in shock today as news broke out that Italy's officially joined the American-led OFN despite the best efforts of the Spirit's diplomatic corps. With Italy occupying an important position in the global cold war between the world's three superpowers, it's lost to the OFN as a stinging sight that may carry diplomatic repercussions for the Sphere going forward. Are you kidding me? We spent all that time doing nothing? Are you kidding me? Desperate times, then. Wow, that sucks. That really sucks. And the crisis is here, but... Wait, we sl we got rid of a lot of our military. And then we still have more debt. I mean, that's technically going up, but the deficit went up even higher. Construction spending is, is zero. <laughs> wow. Recon companies? Sure, why not? What if we wanted to convert some stuff? We can't even convert stuff right now. Well, let's let's at least finish through the focuses and see what happens. Anti-air, thank you, thank you. You, nope, goodbye. Desperate times, and we have another focus. The sand settles. The sand is settled in the Middle East. We have now made our commitments and decisions. We must now live with the consequences. Very, very generic. Anything, any other tree? So that, that right side is done. And down here, we've pretty much done everything I think we can. So this probably is the end of the campaign once the sand settles. That's so disappointing that Italy went with their with their way. Yeah, why would we give them anything now? 
you you didn't want to see us at all. I mean, we tried to help you out, but five million to the Arabs' cause and gain our own reward. Hmm. Nope. Well, that sucks. Organization Free Nations. So what happens? Is the Navy included in the military spending? 18.67? Let's see. Let's get rid of one of these fleets and see what happens. Let's get rid of my subs. As much as I love subs. So 18.67. No. If you get rid of your fleet, that means nothing. So the, apparently the Navy costs nothing at all. Interesting. But happy 1972, everyone. Hope you're having a great year. That's a lot of civilian spending, though. Holy cow. Maintenance companies doesn't really matter at this point, but whatever. Let's grab some scout helicopters, get hospitals, and grab some transport helicopters. Cause why not? 3.5 billion. Well, I don't want to get rid of these guys. Bye, Marine. Sorry, you cost me too much right now. Sand settles. That barely helps out. And what if I get rid of you? Well, I think that's probably it for Japan. I don't think we have anything else. So, Japan was definitely an interesting nation to play as. Obviously, they weren't perfect early on. I mean, there's a lot, lot, tons of reading, which was cool. A lot of lore, a lot of things developing as learning why Japan economically falls. And as a, at this point, we could probably assume that this Tiberian Free Territory will reunite Russia under anarchism. But, regardless, if you enjoyed the campaign, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll see all of you tomorrow in a different campaign. Thanks for watching, though, and have a great rest of your day.